Sunday night, Revelation, that's our subject. We've been on the book of Revelation. This is our 72nd message or the 72nd week on the book of Revelation. 72 tapes and people say, do you have anything on Revelation? Well, I got a whole bunch of other series, but this one has lasted for 72 weeks and we have and we're coming right up close to the end of it. I haven't hit every verse in it, nearly every verse in the book. Uh, if before I finish it, I'll go back and I'll kind of uh, kind of what do you call it? And you pick out pick out all the the verses that I haven't dealt with, kind of like a little melange of different verses, and I'll put them all together in one set of verses and explain the rest of it. Uh, the reason people can't understand the book of Revelation, I keep saying, is because they don't understand the spiritual as opposed to the literal. It's like somebody said last week, Revelation, I think it was Ken said, it's a summation, it's a summary of all the rest of the Bible. Uh, Revelation, of course, is the word apocalypsis, A-P-O, K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. Revelation, it comes from apo, meaning a removal or off with the K-A-L-U-P-T-O, calupto. It means a removal of the cover. Now, what has been covered up is the Old Testament. The Old Testament seems to be mystical to too many people. But the Old Testament is the shadow, as I said this morning, and what God is doing in Revelation, he's telling us what the shadow is in the very image. I could preach on this continually. In the very image, what he is showing us, he's revealing what the true temple of God is. The temple in the Old Testament was Solomon's temple and was patterned after the tabernacle. The tabernacle. And now what he's revealing to us. What he's, when he's taking off the cover, he's telling us that we're the temple of God. He's revealing the throne of God, which was the Ark of the Covenant over here. And God speaks about the throne there in the fourth chapter of Revelation. Now the law is written on fleshy tables of the heart. It was written on, it was written on tables of stone kept inside the Ark of the Covenant over here. So he's telling us, he's revealing to us when he's talking about these things, he's revealing actually the shadows of the Old Testament and he's incorporating it with the very image and showing us, he's actually showing the difference between the Old Testament and the New. And the New is the spiritual Jew, the spiritual temple, spiritual circumcision, the spiritual Ark of the Covenant, the spiritual Passover, the spiritual Day of Atonement, the spiritual ingathering, the spiritual trumpets, and we see that all through the book of Revelation. Now, we, we have gone through the book somewhat thoroughly, I believe, and we're in verse 11 of chapter 20. Chapter 20 is the only book in the Bible, the only chapter in the Bible, anywhere in the Bible, where men have formulated what they call a thousand-year reign after this is over with. You will not find the thousand-year reign anywhere else in the Bible. So if this has been wrongly translated, and I believe it has, uh, into the English, and people say, well, who do you think you are? What do you mean wrong translation? Uh, what kind of authority are you? I'm not an authority. I'm a student and a scholar of the word. Scholar doesn't mean an expert. Scholar is a student. And I'm a scholar of the word, studying the word. And what I do is stu study these Greek words. The, where they, and what they call this chapter, they call this the Kilius chapter. C-H-I-L-C-H-I-L-I-A-S-T. This is the Kilius chapter. And Kilius were people who believed in Kiliasm, C-H-I-L-I-A-S-M. And Kiliasm were people 
who believed in a thousand year reign after this is all over. Well, that is part of dispensationalism. I've said before that the dispensationalists believe that the Bible is divided up into periods of time where men receive the message of God in a different way in these different time areas. And they call them dispensations. And they say, Adam lived under uh, innocence and then Noah lived under conscience. And then, then you had the law and Moses lived, Moses lived under the law. And then after the law and the prophets came the age of grace, they say, and that's the New Testament church age. And then after the New Testament church comes the, the rapture, a pre-trib rapture. And then you've got the end of time. And during that pre-trib rapture period, uh, during the last seven years, that's when God's going to save the Jews. And then they have a thousand year reign. Well, I don't believe any of that. Because they were saved the same way we are. You can knock out all these division lines. The law was there because of transgressions. And now the law is written in our hearts. And thou shalt not kill is written in the hearts of every believer. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the Sabbath is every day now. Well, they say that the church is a different age from Israel, but the Bible says that Israel was the church. And Stephen said that when he stood before the Sanhedrin, he said that Jesus was with the church in the wilderness. And that word church is ecclesia, the New Testament word there in the seventh chapter of Acts. Then they say there's a pre-trib rapture. We don't believe that because the Bible says... In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52, Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And we see trumpets sounding at the end of time in Matthew 24, Matthew 24 and verse 29. After the tribulation of those days, here's the things that will happen. And he says the Son of I'll be turned to darkness, the moon will not give her light. And then in verse 31, 32, he says, The Lord shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet after the tribulation of those days. And then you've got seven trumpets in Revelation 8th chapter, 9th chapter, and 10th chapter. And when the seventh one sounds, the mystery of God is finished. That's the church. Well, they say there's a thousand year reign after this is all over. That is called premillennialism, that Christ will come back and take the saints out before the millennium. That's called pre-M-I-L-L-E-N-I-A-L-I-S-M. That's called premillennialism or before the millennium. Well, that's a new doctrine. That's called Darbyism. And that's not what the church taught. The church taught up to the 1830s that the millennium was the time period from Christ, Christ, until the end of time. Where did this doctrine come from? Where did this doctrine, Kiliism, come from that says there's a thousand year reign? Augustine says that it came from the Jews, that the Jews started this doctrine back even in the early part of the church, that the Jewish, the Judaizing believers wanted their own special kingdom. So they taught that Jesus was going to come back. These were Jews that had become believers, but they wanted their own special kingdom. And they started this doctrine of a thousand year reign after Jesus come back. Now, one thing I don't understand about that. What's the, what's the thousand year reign for? Uh, what is it for? I mean, when you're going to have eternity over here and we're going to have this magnificence uh, wherever God is, in heaven with wherever God is, how is this right here, a thousand years, going to compare with this over here? And why would he keep us here with a bunch of sinners? And they call this kingdom of heaven and those same Kiliest believe that men who are 
that the church will be raptured here at the beginning of the tribulation and that there will be Jews that are saved during this time period and that some of them will be unbelievers when Jesus comes back and they'll live into the millennium and that when they live into the millennium that some of them be dying along the way here. Well, the Bible says flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, how can they be living here, a bunch of sinners, and here we are on our thrones in a thousand-year reign, and we're looking down and we're associating with these sinners. Why don't God just get rid of all of them and take us into eternity? It, it's a doctrine that makes no sense whatsoever, especially when you look at this chapter and when you look at the word thousand. Why would thousand be an incorrect translation? Because... The men who translated this during the King James period were, half of them were Roman Catholics and half were Protestants. So what, why was it they were wanting to do this? Well, certain men latch on to it because it's, uh, it was something different at the time and now it's commonplace for people to believe that. And whenever they came up with the pre-trib rapture, they also came up with the premillennialism and they start, started believing in both of them at the same time. Those two doctrines was something that J.N. Darby brought to America in the 1830s. And no one in the church in America was preaching that up to that time. And C.I. Schofield propagated that doctrine throughout America with his Bible and his notes. Now, when you see the word thousand, it is the word kilia. C-H-I-L-I-A. And, it, and it, it is plural. And it means 2,000 or more. Now, what we believe, we believe that the church, the church since Christ to the end of time. I'm going to say this one more time. I think I said it last week. I believe that God's got time measured out just like he had the first chapter of Genesis. Just like he had the first chapter of Genesis, when he created the heavens and the earth, he didn't create the earth in six days. The Bible doesn't say that. He created the heavens and the earth, created heaven and earth in verse 1. Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verse 1. Then the Bible says, the earth was without form. Well, without form is the word T-O-H-U-W. It means empty or vain. That's what it means. Well, Isaiah 45, 18 says, God says, all that I created, I created the earth to be inhabited. I created it not. I Created it not in vain. And in vain is the word T-O-H-U-W. God said, I did not create the earth tohu. So when the earth becomes without form or tohu, that's not part of the creation in the first verse. What you've got is a picture of the elect. The earth is created in innocence. And then, and then, uh, and the earth is, and the heavens are created in verse 1. The sun, moon, and stars are created in verse 1. Then God says, let there be light. Let there be light. That's not where God created the light. He created the light up here in verse 1. Then he says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Well, when he says, let there be light, the scientists say there was once a dust cloud around the earth, and we know something was blocking the light from going into the chaos. It was the clouds or of dust or something, because darkness was on the face of the deep. Darkness wasn't just on the deep. Darkness was on the face. There was no shining up on the face, on the exterior of the earth. So evidently, some 
something was hiding the light or blocking the light. Some kind of canvas of some kind of wrapped around the earth, dust. So when God says, let there be light, that's a picture of circumcision. I'm saying this for a reason. When God says, let there be light, it's like we're innocent, creating innocence. Then Satan moves into our hearts. And then he says, let there be light. Now, I believe the seed of everything was in the first verse. Everything brought forth seed after its kind. God didn't create the seed later on. That's not what it says. It said everything brought, the seed was in itself, he said. So, when he says, let there be light, that's a picture of circumcision. And then, he said the evening and morning were the first day, first day. Those are not days of creation. They're days of making and forming. They're works of a potter. When you create, create is different than forming. When God, David said in the Psalms that God creates with his breath. When he formed Adam from the dust of the ground, that was the work of a potter. But when he created, it's when he went, that was the creation. And the Jews call this word create in verse 1 of Genesis 1. The Jews call that ex... E-X-N-I-H-I-L-I-O, ex nihilio. That means to breathe out of nothing is what it means. So the creation is not the forming. The point I'm getting at, you immediately have following up after the first day of creation, not first day of creation, there wasn't a first day, there was a time of creation, then you've got the earth without form, and you got a time period between verse 1 and verse 2 where that darkness comes and everything is in vain without form. Tohu. But God said, I didn't create that in the first verse. That's what he says. So there could have been millions of years between verse 1 and verse 2. Some people call that the gap theory. But I believe it takes more of a theory to believe in in trying to make these days, days of creation, because what comes after verse 1, by mere definition of the word without form, and we find that's not what God created without form or in vain, there in Isaiah 45, 18, what he creates is an innocent earth. Satan moves in. This is a picture of you and I as the elect. And then God circumcises our heart and tells Satan, get out of the way. I let the light in my innocent creation. This is my child. And then he starts six work days. I got an old book. I got out of a used bookstore back in the mid-60s when I was traveling on the road. It, it's the title of it. It's the six work days of God. Well, God starts six work days and six is the number of man. Six is the number of man. I believe that... We can only trace Adam. We can trace back to Adam 6,000 years. But we cannot trace back to the beginning because we do not know what took place between verse 1 and verse 2. I believe between verse 1 and verse 2, the very essence of chaos or without form is Satan, isn't it? God never varies in evil in the universe. He says, I change not and he creates evil. He says, I, I make light and create darkness. I, make, I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. How does he create evil? He does it by creating Satan evil, and then Satan performs the evil that God wants him to perform, and the rest of the evil God will restrain. That's what Psalm 76 and 10 says. The wrath of man shall praise thee, and the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. So when Satan is in the earth in verse, between verse 1 and 2, in Revelation 12, we see Satan cast into the earth. And that's a panoramic view of all time where the, where the dragon is seeking to devour the uh, child of the woman. And that's a picture of Christ coming out of the church or Israel. So... I believe Revelation 12, when a third of the angels are cast out of heaven by Michael the archangel, that's 
that the, that the time factor of that is between verse 1 and 2 of Genesis. Because Satan is in the garden in Genesis, the third chapter, talking to Eve in the form of a serpent, isn't he? It, when he's cast into something, he was cast out of heaven uh, until, and he was perfect until an imperfection was found in him there in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. And when he was cast out, I believe it's between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis. There are no six days of creation. There are six work days of God that he works on man and six is man's number all through the scriptures. That's why I believe what he's done. What he's done is he has measured out time in six days. Six days. A day is for the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day in the Bible from... from uh, Adam, not from the creation. You can't get back. Let me, let me show you this. If Adam were here, and the New Testament church right here, the beginning would be way down the other side of Gallatin. Maybe way beyond, way beyond Canada. Wait a minute. The beginning would be way out there beyond the north stars. If Adam were here and we were here, you cannot measure time from the beginning. You can only measure time from Adam. Now, the way God counts, the reason I believe he counts this way is because what we saw in the first chapter where that he has six work days. So what I believe he does, he measures out time, 4,000 years, Days of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years one day. And then you have 2,000 years to the end of time. Now, I believe that, but God doesn't count the way we count. And let me give you something else that you might think about. God only counts in Scripture from Adam to Jesus, and it's right about 4,000 years. Right about 4,000. Four all through the scripture is when the... Four is not the number of the resurrection. The resurrection comes in three, doesn't it? Right? Third day Jesus resurrected. On the third day... Well, let me just show you this. Go back to Genesis, the first chapter. Go back to Genesis, first chapter... Verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. This is resurrection of life, isn't it? Whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day, and life or resurrection came on the third day, didn't it? Resurrection came on the third day, but the resurrector came on the fourth day. Jesus, the Savior, comes on the fourth day. When Israel was in Egypt, the deliverer Moses came after 400 years, and when Lazarus was in the tomb in John 11, he laid in the grave four days before Jesus came to resurrect him. So you see the fours all through the Scripture, and, I don't, and of course, what I was getting at, we don't believe in a thousand-year reign after this is over. And... I'm not the only guy in the world that believes that. There's a name, uh, Cox's book on, uh, on uh, amillennialism. I, th I used to think amillennialism was a cult thing. That's what's so funny. I thought, this is cultic. 
R A M I L L E N I A L I S M. You have amillennialism, you have premillennialism, and you have post post millennialism. Premillennialism says Jesus is going to come back before the thousand years. Postmillennialism says he's going to come back at the end of the thousand years. And you know what? Postmillennialism makes more sense than premillennialism. Because that's actually when he's going to come back at the end of the Kilia, but it won't be at the end of a thousand years after this is over. But there's a verse that shows postmillennialism, and the reason the postmillennialists believe he'll come back at the end of the thousand years is particularly because of a verse here in verse 4 and 5, speaking of these people who received the mark of Christ upon their foreheads and in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, and where they build postmillennialism is on verse 5 and 6. Of chapter 20. Here's where they build postmillennialism. And the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Well, the postmillennialists are right, but they're wrong. It will be at the end of the Kilia, but not at the end of a thousand years. It'll be at the end of 2,000 years, but that's not going to be 2,000 years after the end of time. It's going to be the 2,000 years from Christ until the end. So he will come post-millennial. Not post-millennial, post-Kiliism. See that? Now, I didn't know what to... When my father would talk about premillennialism, and I was a kid, and I'd read this verse, I'm going, gosh, that don't make any sense. And then he says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That's when Christ comes back for us. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, I'm going to say this one more time. That word thousand is always the word Chilia, C-H-I-L-I-A, and it's plural. It means 2,000 or more. I believe that. Now, when people say, what do you mean? What do you mean the Lord will come back after 2,000 years after Christ? Well, here's the point right here. Let me, let me stop and give you this. There's a key to the last 2,000 years. It's found in Acts 2. When Jews from every nation under heaven were gathered at, at uh, Pentecost because of the feast days of the Jews, the three feast days they were required to come to, Peter stood up at Pentecost and he said some of the most profound words when he said, this is that. This is that. This that's going on, that you're hearing these men from every nation speak in glossa, foreign language, and dialects. He said, this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel, that in the last days this would happen. So if this is what's going to happen in the last days, the very latest the last days could begin would be in Acts 2, wouldn't it? Pentecostals say, well, no, all the last days is, is something that started in, in Joplin, Missouri, Galena, Kansas area in 1904. No, it's not. Not the last 75 years. The last days were here. Well, if we knew when that was, and I don't know, I don't believe the last day started with the birth of Jesus. The last days surely is the time of the Gentile church. Jesus was resurrected from the dead 50 days before Acts 2. Uh, it was 50 days from Passover to Pentecost. Passover to Pentecost. Pent means five. Pentecost means 50th. So they're right here at the time of Jesus being resurrected. 
So if the last days begin here in Acts 2, the last 2,000 years, we don't, all, all chronology is unreliable. All the calendars are unreliable. You can't find anybody that can pinpoint or nail down. We can trace our, our time back to here, but we don't know how God measured time on his maps. The only thing we know, and on his chronology, we don't know how he did it. But we do know something Peter said. This is the last days right here. The Bible says no man's going to know the day or the hour that Jesus comes back. But the scripture says in Matthew 24, when you see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. No man will know the day or the hour, the exact time, but we will know the season according to Paul in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. So if this is that, that's probably some of the key words of prophecy right there. This is that that will happen the last days. Well, if it's happening here and it will happen the last days, this is the last days, isn't it? Is that hard to understand? It's not hard at all. I don't know why the Pentecostals have missed that. I mean, what happened to the Holy Spirit from here to 1904? Well, no, we hadn't because, no, we hadn't. Look here. We don't know exactly what year this was. We know that Jesus was born. The calendar was redone by Dionysius the monk. And we know that he, that he juggled the calendar for Roman Catholic reasons and got Jesus' birth back f four years Four years off. So Jesus was born at least four years up to 10, 12, 14 years off. Could be four years. Let's just say four years. Therefore, if Jesus was born in 4 B.C., we think of 33 A.D. where he, where he died. 33 A.D., right? Well, he wouldn't have died in 33 A.D. because our calendar is at least four years up to 16, 17 years off. So he would have died somewhere around 29 A.D. Varying, that's just a neighborhood. We're not exactly sure. Well, if the last days are here in Acts 2, I don't believe the last days started till Acts 2 because that correlates with the pouring out of the, of the Spirit on the Gentile elect church. Now, I'm not saying this is when the Lord's coming because I don't believe in setting dates. But if you take 2,000 years from 29 A.D., that takes you to 2,029, doesn't it? I'm not saying that's when he's coming. I'm just saying. I'm giving you this for your understanding of how God measures things. So you can speculate on this all you want to. He could have been... If we were off more than that, he could have been born in 28, 27, 26, 20. Oops, that'd make it 2020, wouldn't it? Now, I'm not saying that's the way it's going to happen. Now, the Bible does say that except those days be shortened, God says, I'm going to cut off some time off of those days. There will no flesh be saved. And he's talking about no elect flesh for Christ to come back and take them out to meet the Lord in the air at the last trump at the end of time. So I believe he's going to shorten the days. I don't know if the Lord's going to come in 2010, 2015, 2020, 2030, 2040. I don't believe it's 100 years from now. Because the Jews have fallen by the edge of the sword. They've been led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem is trodden down of the Gentiles, Luke 21, 24, until the Gentile rule over the Jews is finished. And that happened in 1967. The Six-Day War. And the Bible says this generation will not pass away when the Gentile rule of the Jews is finished until all is fulfilled. When these things begin to come to pass, lift up your hand and look up for your redemption draweth nigh. 
Now, Stan was born in 1967. Well, and he's 37, 38 now, 36, 37, 38, somewhere around there. Uh, he probably won't tell me. Now, 67. So what the Bible's saying, this generation, this generation will not pass away. The word generation is the word G-E-N-E-A, Ganea. comes to the word gene. Gene. Gene, our genes are our existence. What he's saying, these genes will not pass away. I don't believe Stan's generation will pass away until all is fulfilled. Huh? You, there is no benchmark. Don't get into that. Nobody can prove nothing on that. That's not the point. The point is these genes, you don't use a benchmark, period. You can stay up all night long with 40 different scholars saying 40 different things. It's 40 years, it's 100 years, it's 30 years, it's 25 years, it's 10 years. The point is, not how long a generation is. He doesn't say when this generation is over with, did he? He said when these things begin to come to pass... Not when they've been happening a long time. Not when this generation has passed away. He says this generation will not pass away. These genes will not finish. You get into people arguing about how long a generation is. It doesn't matter how long a generation is. Because he said this one won't pass away. It'll come short of a generation. Now... That's what I believe this Killy is leading us to. That's what I believe it is. I hope I'm alive when Jesus comes. Maybe it will be in 2015 or, and I'll be 76 years old. Well, wouldn't that be great? Maybe it will be in 2020 and, and I'll be 81. I don't care. I just hope it's soon. I'm, I'm tired of the world. I'm sick and fed up with it. Sick of fighting the battle, but I'll keep fighting until it's over. So, that's what the 20th chapter of Revelation is about. It's about the 2,000 years or the last days, and God will shorten those days. Otherwise, no flesh will be saved. Now, that used to scare me to death. I don't, does that scare anybody? Huh? Does it make people think, oh, gosh, I don't want this to happen? Don't get into the mindset of, trying to talk this in a circle and talk your way out of it because you don't want the end to come because you've got this future you want to live. You know what's in the future? A dead end. It's a dead end street. I was reading, a, I was reading an article by a big superstar rocker, and he said, I think it was a rock star, and he said, he said everybody's trying to get to the top. It's a guy who had all his fame and everything, and now he's not out there fighting it. He said, everybody's trying to get to the top. He said, there's nothing up there. He said, and everybody that climbs that ladder knows when they get there, they don't even know they're there because they keep trying to go higher and there's nothing there. It's just a, it's an empty feeling when you get up there and say, give me more applause. And then when you face sags and you, get an ugly look about yourself and your hair gets gray and you've been on drugs too long and nobody wants you anymore. It's a fast fall to the bottom. All right. That's what this thousand years is about. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan's going to be loose for a little season to deceive. The way Satan, he's not going to come wearing a red suit and a pitchfork in his hand, a tail and a and hooves on his feet, going, ha, 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 I'm here to deceive everybody. <laughs> that really fools people, doesn't it? <laughs> no, Satan's going to come with good words and fair speeches. I never heard so many good words and fair speeches as I did this past week. What a bunch of foolishness. Everybody was applauding the Pope, and isn't he wonderful? And he believed you have to eat the literal flesh of Christ to get to heaven. The Pope went to hell. If you believe Catholic doctrine. 
if he believed Catholic doctrine. Well, if anybody believes Catholic doctrine, I think it's the Pope, isn't he? Because he sets the doctrine. And people say, how can you say that? Well, the Bible says, unless you take your cross and die daily, you can't be my disciple. You have to be hated. Jesus had to hate. I don't, did the world hate the Pope? No, everybody loved him. And I'm not saying he was a mean, nasty man. He was probably a real nice guy. He was brilliant, spoke ten languages. That won't get him into heaven either. And I saw a biography on him the other night. They said he was studying science at six and seven years old, physics and chemistry and calculus, and he was brilliant. But that won't get him to heaven either. He's popular. He's liked by men. And he did do a lot of, quote, good works, but he did it with an ulterior motive to further the Roman Catholic religion. Didn't say he wasn't a nice guy, but I'll tell you what, when they get in control... If they were in control, they'll kill you, Bill Clinton, George Bush, if you're not a Catholic. They, those guys are ignorant. They don't, Bill Clinton is a stupid man. He's very smart, IQ-wise, but he's stupid. I mean, here a few years ago, he was somewhere in Africa or somewhere. I can't remember where it was. He was at a Catholic church, and they passed out the Eucharist, and he took it and ate it, being a Southern Baptist. You dumb bail, don't you know that they, they, they threw a fit when he did it? Y'all remember that? Threw a fit. You can't eat the literal flesh of Christ unless you are Roman Catholic. And you can't go to heaven unless you eat the flesh of Christ. They believe Bill Clinton is going to hell. Well, I believe that too, but, <laughs> but it's just insane what they believe. I believe we're at the end of time so that gives you six days from adam until the end i don't know when jesus is coming and i'm but the bible does say you're not the children of the darkness there in the fifth chapter of first thessalonians you're not the children of the darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief the lord will come as a thief in the night to the unbeliever but we're not in darkness that it should come on us unaware when we see these things come to pass well, look at that matthew 24 go over there matthew 24 and then i'll come back This used to scare me real bad when somebody talked about this. And now I've been through life so hard and so long that it just I just get fed up. I get sick of it. I'm just, I'm wore out. Does anybody get wore out besides me? Huh? Look here. When he sends his angels with the great sound of a trumpet in verse 31... Then verse 32, now learn a parable of the fig tree. Now there's two, a double picture here in this parable. When its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that the summer is nigh. Israel was called a fig tree. When you see Israel blossoming, which they've been doing since 1948, particularly 1967, when they get Jerusalem temple site back in the Six-Day War, you know that summer is nigh. He said you, and he's not only talking about Israel, he's talking about a literal fig tree. Hey, dummies. I'm, that's what he's saying to the Pharisees. When a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and, he's, and it's no sign be given but the sign of the prophet Jonah, he's saying, you look at the sky and you say it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red and lowering. He said, you bunch of... Pharisees, well, that's what they were, weren't they? You bunch of Pharisees. He said, you can look at the sky and tell the face of the sky. Why is it you will not discern the signs of the times? Then he says, you can look at a fig tree and tell when summer's here. You can look at the signs and tell when Jesus is coming. Then he says, so likewise, ye, when you see all these things... Know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Now he just got through saying, 
you'll know it's at the door when you see these signs previously in the chapter. And this is a sister chapter to Luke 21. So you can read Luke 21. And when you see the Jews fall by the edge of the sword, led away captive at all nations until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. When you see this happen... This is the generation that won't pass away. Know that it is nigh even at the doors. And then he gives you an illustration. But of that day and hour knoweth no man what he's saying of the exact time. People say, don't you think it would be another hundred years? No. Don't you think it could be a thousand years? No. And I heard somebody, they actually did a special the other night on the history channel or something and they were talking about the church and they were talking about this doctrine with some good narrator saying uh this was brought by jan darby to america and they actually brought it out on history channel and said that uh there this rapture is where these saints believe that they're going to be taken out uh to meet jesus christ uh in the air they even brought that out and people will say Nobody knows, ex when the Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour, therefore it could be a thousand years. No. The Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour, but I'm going to give you signs, and you'll know the season. You can discern the face of the sky. Don't refuse to look at the signs of the times. But as the days of Noah were, here's how it's going to be, and he's explaining the previous parts of this chapter. As the days of Noah were, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. Or the Son of Man be. For as, here's verse 38, it's going to tell you what's going to be happening because this is what was happening during the days of Noah. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were partying. Isn't this world in one, isn't this one big world party that they're in? It's one party because what kind of a new car can I get? Where can we eat? There's McDonald's, here's Arby's. Wait a minute, there's this nice restaurant down here. There's one over here. Uh, when are we going to get that boat? When are we going to get that new, that new diamond ring? When am I going to get, when am I going to have this? When am I gonna, we're in a, that's a party. When am I going to get everything that make my flesh enjoy life? That's the party that we're in, isn't it? They'll be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. They'll be marrying two different things, truth with a lie. And I've never seen the like of this where men are marrying truth to a lie like they are today. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came. Now, people, I've heard preachers say, yeah, and they went up on the door of the ark. They went up on the ark, and they were knocking on the door, saying, Noah, let us in. No, they weren't. God shut the door, and boom, the fountains of the great deep broke up these rivers underground, the, the largest rivers in the world, and the crust broke open, and Noah went up on a tidal wave 5,000 feet high, and there took off the ark. They didn't have time to run up the ramp of the ark. Say, no, let us in. No. They couldn't get it out of their mouth. It didn't just start raining. It did. But what really caused the immediate flood were the fountains of the great deep. Poof, exploding. Wouldn't that have been something to see? I wish somebody had videotaped that. Huh? Well, Genesis 6, 13, yeah, that's what it is. That's, the, that's the, the sons of God intermarrying with the daughters of men. Huh? Well, right before that, he's talking about the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. Genesis 6. Sons of God are marrying the daughters of men. They're giving in marriage. Truth is marrying a lie. The idol worshippers are marrying 6, 6, 13. God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Isn't there violence in the world today? This is at the end of the 2,000 years, is what it is. And go back over here at Matthew 24. And they knew not till the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming, the parousia, 
P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. The physical arrival of the Son of Man be. It's going to be in a day when the world think not. And we're to be watching. I wouldn't be surprised knowing that there's going that Men and evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, and men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parent, unthankful, unholy, despisers of those that are good, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. In the fifth chapter of First Timothy, all of these things are going to be happening. Uh, excuse me, Second Timothy. I'll get it right in a minute. And took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And this is what confuses a lot of people. Then shall be two in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. It took two women to grind. They had a mill. One had a big heavy stone. They sat down, straddle leg at the stone. And one woman held the bottom stone, and the other turned the top of the stone. Uh, it was made out of a lava rock, and it was grinding. They were grinding the mill. And this is what they're talking about. This is what this is talking about. It's talking about two people are going about their everyday life when Jesus comes in the air at the last trump and we'll go out to meet him. One will be taken, that's us, and the other one left to be destroyed. And I believe immediately when he takes us up in the air, he'll destroy the earth. That's what it's talking about. I don't know what confuses people about this because the time factor of this is after the tribulation of those days in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, and then it goes into all the things that's going to happen after the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation. Now let's go back over here to Revelation. I believe we're... I have never been more distressed and depressed about the world. I really struggle with this daily. I mean, I need some... Uh, what's that stuff you take... Uh, for depression. No. <laughs> Prozac. Prozac. I need some Prozac. <laughs> I need Prozac. No. I, I don't need Prozac. But that's what I feel like. I mean, this thing, I think everybody thinks, I think everybody thinks Jim is, Jim has always got it together. He's always up. No, I'm not. First of all, I got to go out there and fight the world. And then I got to fight people at Grace and Ruth Ministries. I'm going, oh, God, where's my Prozac? What? You said you needed some NyQuil. <laughs> Need some NyQuil. <laughs> Who said that? Sleep. Put me to sleep, some NyQuil. Yeah. I just get, I mean, do y'all get as depressed as I get sometimes? I work and work and work and preach and preach, and then people at Grace and Truth give me a hard time, and, and I'm weary and I'm tired and I'm wore down, and... And me and Mary try to get out and go somewhere and recreate a little bit to get away from it all. And people gripe about that. Good grief. God help us. Now, let's go back. So this is the end of time. This is definitely the end of time. Now, Revelation is not all about the end of time. At the end of the 2,000 years. Now, let's go back over here in verse 11. Here's what's happening at the end of the 2,000 years. Verse 10, God's going to cast the beast and the false prophet uh, into the... He's going to cast the devil that deceived is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 11, I saw a great white throne. We've already said in 1 Kings 10 and 18 and in 2 Chronicles 9 and 17 that Solomon was building the throne in the temple of God, in Solomon's temple, and he built it of ivory, and what Solomon's temple was called was a great white throne. This is a picture of going before the throne of God. <coughs> a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. What does that mean? Well, it is the end of the world, but this is the same thing in the sixth chapter of Revelation where the kings of the earth are going to hide themselves from him that sits upon the throne because the heavens is the rule. 
is the ruling class and the earth is the ruled. And he's talking about the heavens of this world, the ruling class and the ruled of this world. We're going to flee to Christ, but they're going to, f- they're going to flee, flee away from God. I believe this is the same time element as Revelation 6. Look here, Revelation 6. I keep saying these are not sequential events. These are events that are in, uh, they're different events, but they're, sometimes they're the same time element as other places in the Scripture. And I believe this is the tame, same time element where the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. There's found no place for the, ruling, the rulers of this world and the ruling class and the rule of this world that are not believing God. He's talking about all of mankind there that's outside of Christ. Look at verse 13. Well, let's look at 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Now, what he's doing with these seals, the word seal is phragis, S-P-H-R-A-G-I-S, H-R-A-G-I-S. It means a signet. We get the word sign. Or we get the word signature, S-I-G-N-A-T-U-R-E. What he's saying, he's opening a seal and showing John something in the future. It doesn't mean that when he opens the sixth seal and there's a seventh to go, it doesn't mean that the end doesn't come till the seventh seal is opened. When he opens the sixth seal, he's showing him future events of the end. When he opens the seventh seal, he'll show him some other events. It doesn't mean that the events of the seals are sequential either. Because does this sound like the end of time? And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Remember, in Matthew twenty four twenty nine, where the scripture says that after the tribulation of the Those days, the sun will not shine. It'll be turned dark. And the moon will not give her light. Well, that's at the end of time. And that correlates with this. So what he sees behind the sixth seal is the end of time. And the moon became as blood. To become as blood was an old ancient saying. It meant to die. When the moon dies, what happens? What is the purpose of the moon? It's to rule the night. It shines at night. When you don't have any light shining at all, what are you in? Total darkness. This is a picture of the world becoming completely dark with sin. And boy, we're just about there, aren't we? And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. What are the stars of heaven? No. What are the stars? Seven stars in the right hand of Christ. The seven stars in his right hand are the seven angels of the seven churches. And look over here in Revelation 9. Look at Revelation well, 8. Look at Revelation 8, verse 10. The third angel sounded and, the, and there fell a great star from heaven. Down here in chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. What this is, is the judgments of God from the mouths of his saints at the end of time. Back over here to Revelation 6. Which, where was I? Oh, the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, or the judgments of God from the mouth of his prophets at the end of time, and they will kill us for preaching what I'm saying. And, but they won't kill us in America as long as we have our constitutional rights. How are they going to kill us in America? Take away the Constitution. And how is that going to happen? America has to collapse. And the Comptroller General, the national accountant for America, for our American system, who is in Washington, who heads up all of the financial resources of our, of our monetary system, uh, 
James, I forget his name. He says that the, that the nation is going to collapse financially in the next year to two years. He said, we are going down. Well, when that happens, when you have a bankruptcy, there is no government. When a city bankrupts, you don't have a charter anymore. You have to start over from scratch. When they start over, they're going to have a worldwide agenda, and they're going to try to be getting along with everybody, and there's not going to be a constitution or any constitutional rights or civil rights anymore. Nobody will have any. Then they'll start killing us. Then they'll say, look, we got world... We got a world to feed and Jim Brown, you're over there starting trouble and we're all getting along. We're all good Christians. We like the Muslims. We like the Catholics and they like us. And I'm a Baptist and this is my church of Christ friend here. And we all get along. And that'll be the one world religion when everybody holds hands. You're not going to convert everybody to be a Baptist. You're not going to convert everybody to be a Catholic. You're not going to get Muslims to do that. And you're not going to convert everybody to be Muslims. But you can convert everybody to hold hands. And they've already done that. We're already in the one world religion. People don't even know that. Yeah, that's what it is. And he says, And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as fig tree casts her untimely figs, when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll... When it is rolled together, heaven departed as a scroll. What is that? Matthew, Matthew 24, 27. As the lightning shines from the east to west, even so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. He's not just talking about literal islands and mountains. He's talking about the world governing system. Mountains were capital cities of empires, weren't they? And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains, the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens, in the rocks of the mountains. I think that's what he's saying over there. The heavens, the face from whom the face, whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. That's talking about this right here, isn't it? And said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That's very sobering, isn't it? When I heard that read when I was a little kid, I would just sit and tremble in the bench. And that's why when the preacher said, if you don't know tonight, I was ready to run down the aisle because of this verse. Scared the life out of me. And I didn't realize if I was scared and had a fear of God, I was already a believer. Now let's go back over here. Verse 11, chapter 20. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face all the captains and the kings of the earth and the ruling class... And those that are being ruled by these fled away and there was found no place for them. Either the heavens of this world or the earth of this world. What would be the earth of this world? That would be all these people out here that are bowing to the Pope, bowing to Billy Graham, bowing to the king and queen of England, or bowing to Charles and what's her face? <laughs> what's her face? <laughs> what's her face? Yeah. Camilla, bowing to them, and everybody's bowing to the, the ruled is Charles and Camilla, and uh, the ruling class, the heavens is Charles and Camilla, and the ruled are those people, those peasants bowing to them. Bowing to yeah, they're bowing to doctrine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're bowing to doctrines. That's right. That's the ruled, and there's no place for them with God. And the ruled are those people who are higher up, and they allow them people... They allow those people to give them all that adulation and that adoration. I, I hate that. I mean, why should the Pope get more adoration than some sweet little old Christian lady who believes in predestination and sovereignty of God, and she's suffering with cancer, and she's sweet, uh, just real sweet spirit and loves God, and she dies of cancer, and we applaud the Pope and not her. I mean, what has he got that she don't have? Fame and fortune, and that'll put him in hell. 
And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things, which were written in the books according to their works. Who are the dead? The non-elect. They're dead spiritually. They're not alive. They have not been resurrected. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Now, if we are judged according to our works, we're judged right now. Judge is the word crino. It means to decide guilt or innocent. Crino. And God has prejudged us before the world began. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, he justified. That word justified is past tense. It's aorist tense, indicative mood. That word justified is the word D-I-K-A-I-O-O. And that means to render innocent. And we're rendered innocent. We're rendered innocent by the works in us. Can you see how that a man is justified by works and not by faith only? So, crino, judge, means to declare guilt, you're innocent, and God is declaring our innocence right now. We're standing in judgment right now. But it's not us that's doing the work. It's God that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, when the fifth chapter of of 2 Corinthians says that every man will be judged according to his works, it will be because the works that God's going to look at upon us is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's God, it's Christ, the one that's begun a good work in you. He'll perform this work until the day of Jesus Christ, and it'll be God in us. And that's what's judging us or declaring our innocence. That's what James, the second chapter, says. We're justified by works, not saved by works. That's not the word. Justify means to declare innocent. Judge innocent. That's what it means. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Look back at verse 6 of chapter 20. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection at the end of Kilia. On such the second death hath no power. We are resurrected at the end of Kilia, or the 2,000 years at the end of time, and death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, and it doesn't have any power over us, does it? And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And when were our names written in the book of life? Chapter 17, verse 8. Chapter 17, verse 8. When were our names written? The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, or the place of no knowledge, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Their names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. But ours names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world because, of course, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, isn't he? Over there in verse 8 of chapter 13 of Revelation. And all that dwell on the earth, speaking of the world beast system that will rule, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So our names were written, and he was the Lamb slain from the beginning. So, whosoever was not found written in the book of life before the foundation of the world was cast into the lake of fire. Now, let's get on to verse 21. And I keep saying... C-H-A-P-T-E-R 2-1 is not inspired. 
chapter 21 is not inspired. The words in chapter 21, but the words C-H-A-P-T-E-R. 2-1, that's not inspired. The thought continues from the previous chapter. Yeah. Sometimes he's had a separate vision. Yeah. So, in that sense, do the chapters separate the different visions? Well, sometimes, yeah. But this right here, this is not that one of those yeah, he says, and, this is a conjunction here that connects, it's a coordinating conjunction that connects the thought here with previous thoughts. So he says, and I saw new heaven. Well, he says, new heaven and new earth, but he's saying here, uh, and the, whose face the earth and heaven fled away in verse 11 of the previous chapter. I saw new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, we've already gone through this verse, heavens being the ruling class, and God says he's going to form new heavens and new earth in the 65th chapter of Isaiah. Then he says, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. How was the bride adorned? In white. In white. But he's seeing this. He's seeing what this is a picture of. This is a picture of the wedding ceremony. I've gone through this, and I go through this in my wedding ceremonies. That the, the wife was set aside. Wife was the betrothed title. She was called wife for the entire year that she was set apart. The father of the bridegroom, the father of the bridegroom would get together with a friend of the bridegroom and that is a picture that is a picture of the Holy Spirit and that's the friend of the bridegroom the father gets with the Holy Spirit the father picks out a wife and gives it to his son the bridegroom and he goes and meets the wife well, he meets her, and they set, a, set up an engagement period of one year. And this wife is supposed to keep herself chaste all the way through that time period. But if she doesn't, he has the power to forgive her and declare her innocent. And when he comes back for her, at the end of that year, she has to be clothed in white. And white is the righteousness of the saints. Righteousness of the saints. Always the priest had to wear white linen garments. Well, we find in Revelation 7, all those around the throne of God, and they're all clothed in white robes, and the angel asked John, do you know what these are? And he said, no, I don't know. He said, these are those that have made ro their robes white in the blood of Christ, a blood baptism being a death or a martyrdom. So these, this is the wife that we see or the bride. She was called wife throughout the entire betrothal period. But the night he came out to get her at midnight, he came at at midnight, to take her out to his father's house, when he met her, he said to her, when he came to meet her the first time, he said, if you believe in my father, he said, let not your heart be troubled. John 14, 1. You believe in my father, believe also in me, for in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. So that where I am, there ye may be also. And he would go back to his father's house and build a room on his father's house where they would live. Well, when he came, she had to be clothed in white. That was the wedding garment. Look back to the 19th chapter. And people try to say, 
Well, the, when she's clothed in white and she's making herself ready as a bride adorned for her husband, that word adorned comes from the word cosmos. I believe it's the word cosmios. It means to decorate in an orderly arrangement. She had to have on an orderly arranged white garment. Look back here in chapter 19. Right before Christ comes back with eyes as a flame of fire on a white horse in verse 11. Eyes as a flame of fire in verse 12. Vesture dipped in blood, verse 13. And a sharp sword going out of his mouth. In verse 15, and he's going to destroy the nations on down through the rest of that chapter. Right before that, in verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Now, how can the marriage of the Lamb be come in the third chapter when people try to have a rapture and in the third chapter... After the third chapter, how can that be when you still got the wife here and his wife hath made herself ready? What's she making herself ready for? If she's already in heaven, she's putting on the white garment, which she had to have on. And then they had to have lamps in their hands. They had to have, they call it candles. The reason, anytime you see candle in the King James Bible, 1611, that was one of their current nice inventions. They lit everything with candles. But it's not talking about wax candles. It was a little basin, a little bowl, and it had a wax taper in it. And they had, it had oil down in it. And they would just carry that. That was the lamp or the, what's been translated candlestick, which is wrong. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. The church hasn't been taken out yet at this point, as they have they? Now, let's get an example of this in Matthew, the 25th chapter. Let's go over there. Matthew 25. Verse 1. 25. This is about the marriage ceremony. The, after the full year, the, bride, the bridegroom would come back and, would, and he would come at midnight and steal his wife away. Everyone knew it was going to happen in her family and in his father's family knew it was going to happen. The people around, they didn't go out and announce it to the old neighborhood. We know that he's coming back for us and he knows he's coming back for us, but the non-elect out here don't know anything about it. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamp and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Well, yeah, it is the elect. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? No, the ten are not because... Five of them don't have any oil in their lamps, and oil is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. They have no truth. No truth. So, now when they would leave, when he'd come and get her at her father's house, and he'd take him over to his father's house, they'd get there at 1.30, uh, 12.30, 1 o'clock, because they'd take their time and go along the way, And what lit their way, they didn't have street lamps. It was very dangerous to be out there in the streets. So all the way over, they had the entire uh, marriage group, marriage company, and they'd walk together and laugh and joke and talk. And they would walk along with the bridegroom and his bride. Once he took her out of her father's house, she was called bride from then on out. And then they would go over there, this wedding party. They would get to the father's house where he'd built a room on 
And they would go in to the main room and they'd start feasting and partying. And, and, uh, and you had to have two things you had to have. You had to have on white and you had to have the lamp, the lamp with oil. If you did not have a lamp with oil, you could not go. And if you, weren't, if you were not clothed in white, you could not go in. This is a picture of the elect and the non-elect. They have no truth. They have a facade and they look like they're dressed in white, but they're not really dressed in the righteousness of the saints. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil, no truth. No Holy Spirit with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, this was a Jewish wedding. At midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. That verse scared me to death when I was a little kid. That's the very end of time when we're to go out to meet the Lord clothed in white through a blood baptism. And without a blood baptism, people are not going to heaven. And that's a martyrdom. Without being persecuted for righteousness sake, you're not going. And you're not in the wife. Is that like the truth? What well, is the truth? Yeah, the oil. In the Old Testament, they were anointed with oil. We're anointed with the truth over here. Oil was always a picture, every scholar will agree with this, always a picture of, of uh, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the truth. That means that in the end they'll be out scrambling for the truth. Well, that's what they're doing, aren't they? They're, they're ever learning but ever, never able to come to knowledge of the truth. They think they're finding it and they're running around searching for it. But if they're not elect, they'll never see it and never hear it and never find it. Then all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. They lit the lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut, just like it was with Noah. God shut the door. You can't find the truth. And if the Holy Spirit is in us, and we're taken out to meet the Lord, I want to know during that tribulation period, how's people going to get a hold of the Holy Spirit? Afterwards came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name and thy name cast out devils and thy name done many wonderful works? Look at my phony white outfit. I'm a preacher. My name's Paul Crouch. My name is Benny Hinn. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Let's go back over here to. So he says, I, John, saw the holy city. I keep saying, New Jerusalem. What is that? That is the church. Heavenly Jerusalem. Hebrews 12, 22. Hebrews 12, 22. This is what he saw. Twelve in verse twenty-two. But ye are coming to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's us. That's heavenly Jerusalem. How much time do I have? Seven minutes. We covered a lot about the end of time and the Kilia. 
This kind of message scared me real bad uh, when I was a boy. Did anybody ever hear this? I'd hear it, and it, it scared me, but they don't know. The thing is, the preachers I heard didn't know what they were talking about. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, I do believe the preparation of the bride, how long does it take the bride to prepare? Well, I'm talking about the whole bride. Well, from Adam, righteousness is performed. She has been putting on six days. Yeah. She's preparing all the way till when Jesus comes. We're preparing putting on the righteousness by putting on the blood baptism. Our robes are made white. Look at that in Revelation 7. Notice how all these things come together. Revelation 7. There was a great multitude around the throne of God in verse 9, uh, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. And palms in their hands. And sometimes they would throw palms out before the bridegroom and his wife as they went to the house. And cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and all the elders and the four beasts. And fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And that's the preparation of the bride. Yeah, that's in the that's in chapter six. Yeah. Well, it that could be at all times when they're saying there. You're talking about verse nine of chapter six or verse ten of chapter six. Well, let's read that. Go back up. Back to chapter 6, and I'll read 9, 10, 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Testimony, marturia, M-A-R-T-U-R-I-A, comes from the word martus, which is the word witness. We get the word martyr, the one who suffers a martyrdom. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou... Not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. And white robes were given to every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed. It was ordained that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And then the opening of that sixth seal in verse 12 that we read a while ago. Now. Go back, go back over here to chapter 21. Have I any more time? Five, all oh good. Five minutes, okay. I thought that was about ten minutes ago. All right. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride. Adorned for a husband. As I said, these are the same words of the third chapter of Revelation and verse 12. When he's talking uh, to, he's talking to the church uh, at Smyrna. Is it Smyrna? Not Smyrna. Philadelphia. He's talking to the Philadelphian church and he says here in verse 12. Him that overcometh, remember the word overcome is the word nikaio, N-I-K-A-I-O-O. 
It comes from Nike, N-I-K-E. Nike is the word victory, and the and the and the way we overcome the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That's how we overcome, or death to self overcomes. So him that overcometh with faith, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and we are the temple of God, and he shall go no more out, and will not go out of this temple, will continually stay in the temple of God till he comes to meet us, give us our new body from heaven, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes, cometh down out of heaven from God. And I will write upon him my new name. Those are the same words, which comes down out of heaven from God. And we see coming down from God out of heaven in verse 2 of chapter 21, a bright adorn clothed in white. What are you talking about? In, yeah, 21.7, yeah. Did y'all turn that light out on me? Huh? Don't I have, I thought you had, I had five minutes. One minute. What? Y'all are confusing me, turning my light out. When it turns out, I know I'm through. God shall wipe away, where was I? 21, verse 3. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. It's, it's the bride coming down of, out of heaven. The tabernacle of God is with men. The word tabernacle is the word skene. S-K-E-N-E. S-K-E-N-E. And it comes from skuos. S-K-E-U-O-S. S-K-E-U-O-S. And that word... Skuas means a wife that contributes to the usefulness of her husband. In a tabernacle, when I think of the tabernacle, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was while they were wandering the wilderness, that's a picture of us headed towards Canaan, the promised land, and we're headed towards heaven, and we are the tabernacle of God. The tabernacle later was built into the temple, we're the tabernacle. A tabernacle is a mobile temple. The tabernacle was the exact pattern that the temple was to be built when Solomon built it. So this is the church of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. The fact that it's a tabernacle here, the church is, is preparing and adorning herself with white by going through all the tribulations in verse 2. But when it says we're the tabernacle of God, the fact that it used tabernacle and not temple, a tabernacle being one that's on the move all the time, this is the tabernacle right there. And when that cloud started moving at night, or, the, or when the fire uh, moved at night, or the cloud by day, everybody started packing up. Let's get ready, get going. They went any time that God started moving, God moved and they knew it was time to get ready and move. And the first men that come up to the tabernacle to start packing everything up were the Kohathites, sons of Levi. They, it was their job to pack everything, put all the staves in them and carry them, wrap everything in the various colored canvas type covers in the, and the fur covers that they put on them uh, where they had the badger skins dyed red over the tabernacle and so forth. Now, where was I? And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And we went through this back in, you remember in Isaiah, the 65th chapter? Bet you don't remember it, do you? Huh? Do you remember it? Isaiah 65. Isaiah, I guess I hadn't said it a lot. I'll just kind of give it to you. 
God is condemning literal Israel. And he says in verse 15 that I, he'll call his servants by another name or New Testament church. And he says, I create new heavens and new earth. That's the church is the heavens and the earth is those that we rule with the scepter of righteousness are bowing to the will of God. And the former shall not be remembered or literal Israel will not be remembered nor come into mind, but, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that I create for behold, I create Jerusalem or the New Testament Gentile church, a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in heavenly Jerusalem, which will be the new heavens of the new ruling class and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying, because this is alluding to Israel being carried away into captivity, which which Isaiah prophesies through his entire book that Israel will be carried away and God will call the Gentiles to his light. So in, in the literal Jerusalem, they wept. When, when you look at the book of Lamentations, right after they're carried into captivity and Jeremiah is writing these words of lament, they have no temple, they have no home, they have no God, they have no worship because they went after Baal in the grove. And they sinned against God. So when it's talking about in the new Jerusalem, the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her. We're not weeping now in the church because we have no God to serve. Because we don't have a Jerusalem. We don't have a temple. We don't have an Ark of the Covenant. All that is spiritual now. And that's what it's talking about here. Yeah. But God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain in the, in the new Jerusalem, which is us. We're not to fear a man, him that can destroy the body, but him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. When it says no more death, it's talking about a death of Israel and how that they were carried away and they were separated from God. We're not, there's not going to be any more death with us. I believe this is talking about spiritual things. We're not going to be separated from God as literal Israel was. For the former things are passed away. Isn't that the words out of Isaiah 65? The former passed away. So literal Israel has passed away. Now we're spiritual Israel. Everything is spiritual and there's no weeping in the... And the reason they were weeping and mourning was over the fact that they... When they were carried off into Babylon, and they were, they were over here in Babylon, about 750 miles away from Jerusalem. You know how far 750 miles is when you have to ride a camel or a horse or walk? It wasn't like 750 miles today. That took months to get there. The way they traveled. Not unless you got walked fast. What is that fast walking? That they do? Can't you just see a bunch of Jews going? Where are you going? I'm going to Jerusalem. And they got on their little helmet. And they got on their, got their little water bottle. I'm out of time, ain't I? Yeah, I am. Whew. We've hit a lot about the end of time here. Maybe this will scare some people, I hope. But if it does, the ones that get scared are believers. The devil's children are never scared. They're never afraid of what Jehovah God will do to them. And they're the ones that should be, but we're the ones that are afraid that God won't save us. And we're worried about, am I really a believer, aren't we? Now, but wait a minute. You can't say that because he's the only one that says that. Wait a minute. Do we all feel that way? No, Mary says that. Well, I think that's everybody, doesn't it? But we have a fear of God. That's the reason we say those things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words of truth. God, I don't even know what to say to you sometimes. I just pray that you'll help me and help the ministry and Mary and Mike and all those people that work in it, all the people that come. 
Help us to be everything that we should be for you. Fight our battles. Plead our cause, like David said. Fight for us. Lord, I don't want to fight the world. All I want to do is fight sin. Deal with our hearts. Lord, I am really weary. Sometimes I get that way and you bring me out of it. Help us. Lord, I'll keep doing this regardless of the opposition. I will not stop. You know that. You've made me that way. Just give us strength. You started this ministry. Lord, you'll stop it. If you want it to go, it's yours. And Lord, I don't believe you brought us to this point so that it would just reach just a few people. There's an elect family out there. If it's according to your mercy, Lord, open up many doors and opportunities, financial ways for us to get this message all over the United States. Lord, we believe this truly is the truth. God will praise you and glorify you. Help us. Sometimes I feel like some blind man walking into the darkness. I, when you say, go do this, I say, okay, I don't know where I'm going, but I'll do it. Strengthen us and give us courage in your word. Help the church and the flock here. And give them strength and build them up in the faith. And we'll give you the praise for everything. In Jesus' name, amen.